Okay, let's see here. Uh, some of you have done it this year. Excellent. Uh, it's been a while for about 10% of us. Uh, I don't, I don't blame you if you've never done it. It can be like pulling teeth, trying to understand what's going on. Uh, it's uh, to hard to find time. You know, we've got so much other stuff going on. Things are changing on a constant basis. So how do I find time to do it? Well, I'm going to say that there's a, there's assert that there's a really big advantage of doing this. Um, at, on a monthly basis is great, but I get it if you don't have time. So we'll talk about a few things that you can do to really get a lot more out of this. Now, here's a couple of things. You think about what's in those earnings calls. By the way, for those of you who have listened to an earnings call, what did you hear? Go ahead in the chat box. Give us an idea for things that you hear in an earnings call that might be pertinent to your role. And for those of you, again, who haven't, or it's been a while for uh, that you've listened to an earnings call, uh, don't understand it. Those of you might be a little bit challenged because it kind of goes over our heads or uh, talks about stuff that we might not really understand how it's apl applicable to our, our roles. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of things. We're in good company. Uh, a couple of things that we're hearing, sales, margins, EBITDA, what are investors focusing on, what's our debt look like, earnings per share, ads, that sort of stuff. Awesome. Here's a couple of challenges. Number one is that 95% of employees don't understand their company's strategy when they're looking or listening to the messaging that our CEOs and CFOs or other executives may be giving either to the market or even internally. Most of us can't connect what we do on a regular basis to the why, to what we're really trying to achieve as an organization. So 95% of employees don't understand company strategy. This comes from a, a, a study that Harvard Business Review published a number of years back. They also found that 90% of employees couldn't even name one strategic initiative. So obviously that's a big challenge. If we don't understand the strategy, we don't understand really where we're trying to go, what we're trying to achieve as an objective, as an organization. Here's another problem. We talk about, we see that in, in those earnings calls, we hear things like revenue and EBITDA and debt, and what are our ads and where's our growth and how are we growing, uh, record sales, things of that nature. Well, 90% of employees, and this is our experience over the last 20 years, talking with groups that are frontline contributors, new hires, all the way to senior executives, 90% of employees don't understand what are the key business metrics. In other words, when we talk about sales, when we talk about EBITDA, we don't know what we're talking about. We don't know what we're trying to measure. We don't know what those numbers mean. So we're looking at these two challenges and saying, hey, we don't know where we're going. We don't know where we've been. So how in the world do we make a good decision about what we're doing right now? Those are two key challenges. Now apply that to your business, or in this case, we're gonna apply those two challenges to Netflix. Now at Netflix, not only are we a leading company out there, but we, we've led because we've disrupted the market. We have 221 million subscribers. We're the largest streaming service out there. We're not just in the U.S., but we're 190 company, countries, excuse me. And because we've disrupted the, the uh, entertainment industry, there's a target on our backs. And we're not just competing with new upstarts. We're also competing with legacy media who are now moving into the streaming because they see where this is all going. We've got to get there. We've got to get there. So we've got this all going on. We know there are challenges to understanding and connecting the strategy and what we're trying to achieve. We understand that there's a challenge to, under, to connecting to the metrics and why we use those metrics. Imagine you are either Reed Hastings or Ted Sarandos. Imagine you're the CEO. What would you want your employees to know? How would you like them to connect with what you're talking to your message? What would you like your customers to know? A lot of changes going on. What do you want them to know? Why is Netflix the best choice for them? What do you need your shareholders to know? We can do a lot of stuff, but is this actually building value for the people that have invested in this company? And what do you want your partners to know? We may even, we may even compete with some of our partners. So what do you want them to know and how are you going to partner better with them? Now, I promised you something before, but here's my guarantee. If you, if you commit this time, if you commit to yourself, and if you invest in yourself on at least, you know, on a quarterly basis, listening to your earnings calls, a couple of things are going to happen. 
You're going to understand the language. You're going to understand the metrics. You're going to understand the strategy. That's going to build your credibility and influence within your organization. And because of that credibility and influence, that's going to build your career. And because you know where we're going and what we're doing, you have that connection, you know the leverage to pull, that's actually going to have a positive impact on your company as well. So that's my guarantee to you. As you commit your time to building out these skills, it will have a positive impact, a, a positive impact across your career, both personally uh, as well as for the company that you work for. Now, I want to help you get more out of these earnings calls. You've got to realize, though, it's really tough just to jump in. So here are three things that I want you to think about. First of all, you've got to prepare. In fact, this is our process that we've learned works really, really well to get the most out of these earnings calls and out of these periodic, uh, out of these periodic messages that we get. So number one, you've got to prepare for it. Then you've got to analyze what you've got in front of you, but you can't stop there. You have to apply it. So when you're thinking about earnings calls, there are a couple of things that you need to do to prepare. First of all, on if you're looking at our workbook, and hopefully you've got that workbook downloaded and we'll make that available to you. But on page two, it gives you a couple of things to think about. There's a format to most earnings calls. And even when you look at Netflix, which is just slightly nuanced and different, you're still going to see the same thing. But once you've got that, you've got to be, once you understand the, the, the nature of those calls, you got to make sure you have the proper materials, where to go, what to, what to look for uh, compared to what you've seen in the past, and then even meet with your team. So, again, when you're looking at those earnings calls, there's generally a prepared remark, something that's pretty scripted, something that, you'll, that, that seems like they're reading. In fact, they are reading something. But generally, you'll find prepared remarks. For, for Netflix, if you've gone out and looked for Netflixes, you'll see that they have actually prepared a letter to the shareholders. So a couple of things that they refer to, they refer to a, a blog that they, they write in frequently, and they refer to this letter to the shareholders. And this letter to the shareholders takes place of what is usually a scripted, uh, scripted remarks during those earnings calls. Then when you look at the second part, usually in a regular earnings calls, you might have a question and answer period where you'll see, you will hear analysts that follow the industry ask questions and those questions are based on what they're seeing within the results and the strategies that they that the that our executives have put out there before, as well as what they're seeing in the industry. And those can be very, very helpful to understand what's going on in the industry, what pressures are there. Now, for, for Netflix, again, they have a letter to the shareholders, and then they have an interview with an analyst, with one analyst. And this month was or this quarter was with JP Morgan, Doug. Uh, Doug, I forget his last name, but we'll talk about him and cut some questions that he had. So look for those two parts. What's the scripted part? What are they really trying to say? And what are the concerns out there in the marketplace? Now, to get that, again, first thing you need to do, locate the transcript. Think about, you got to find out where it is. So a couple of things that you'll see, if you just Google Netflix IR, Netflix Investor Relations, you'll at the top is going to be their investor relations page. You want to go to a couple of places. You want to look for news and events and also uh, look down in the investor events down here. You'll see a list of those events. Sometimes you'll have to scroll down a little bit and look for more, but right there you'll see Netflix's second quarter earnings interview as well as coming up on October 18th, their third quarter earnings interview. So if you click there, you can also get the information. So in this case, you can watch the video, what they actually did. You can also go out and download the, the letter to the shareholders and the financial statements. And then there's a transcript to the interview. So if you can't watch it, I would, I would encourage you to at least go to look at the transcript and read what's going on. So you get the current information. Now, the other thing you need to understand is what's going on, what's happened in the past. What we're trying to do is really understand how their how their strategies and performance has evolved over time so make sure you review your notes from the past and then meet with your team get a different perspective help them understand what's going on so these three things again locate the transcript and all the other materials that you might want to look at review your notes so you can see the evolution of strategy and performance and then meet with your team you've got to be able to get that other perspective it'll expand your own perspective uh, so once we've done that, we've got that down. Now we move into the analysis part. 
So let me give you a little bit of a framework because it can really be challenging to jump into these uh, calls and understand what the message is, what we're really trying to get out of it. So we have this five business driver framework. And that five business driver framework is five easy things to remember. We can bucket all of those messages into these five different aspects of the, of, of the business to better understand what we're trying to do, why it's important, and what are the levers that we need to pull to make good decisions and, and achieve the goals and objectives we're trying to achieve. So it'll help us connect to strategy and it'll help us understand the metrics we're using to, uh, to understand our success and our progress along this. Now, one of the reasons why we're really confident in this business model is because if you look at the financial statements and you look at how we talk about performance, it aligns very, very well with the three main financial statements and what we're trying to, to measure. So we're looking at cash, we're gonna see cash flows and statement of cash flows and how we're deploying capital and things of that nature. When you're looking at the income statement, we're measuring all of those profit metrics. So whether it's sales and how sales translates to revenue, uh, how revenue translates to EBITDA or EBIT or operating income or pre-tax income and also the net income and then also balance sheet. What's our financial strength? How well are we using the, the, uh, the investments that we've made? So if you haven't gone through this before, and even if you have in the workbook, we've given you that framework. And then also under each section, you see cash, profit, assets, growth, and people. You'll see a quick synopsis, a quick uh, description of what each of those drivers is. Beneath that, you'll hear, uh, you'll look at examples, things to listen for, uh, metrics, to identify that have to do with that driver. Now, listen, we all got a different perspective. So what we're looking at may not always be the same as how someone else reads it. And that's okay. What we got to do is get that perspective. But here you have a quick synopsis of what to, of how to understand each driver and what to look for in each driver. So when we're looking at cash again, we're looking at how much cash do we have and how are we driving cash? Right, the cash flow. How are we sustaining our business through the cash that we're driving from our operating activities? Profit. We're looking at revenue. We're looking at all the expenses that we we uh, incurred to drive the revenue, and we're measuring the profit, the impact of our decisions. Assets. We're looking at the balance sheet. So we're looking at what assets we have compared to the liabilities that we owe, and the equity, the portion that our shareholders own, the net worth. If you're thinking about your own financial uh, position. So assets, we're looking at the strength and we're looking at how well you, we're using it. In other words, utilization, all those return on metrics. Growth goes up. So growth is an increase or improvement over time and people are dear to our hearts. Internal customers, external customers. So in short, five business drivers, five things we need to understand to make sense of what we're doing. And on the other side, you can see some questions. So as you're listening to or reading the message, the prepared remarks, and the questions, these, mess, these uh, questions can help us get a little bit more, like help us read between the lines and get a little bit more out of what we're reading and we're trying to interact with at this point in time. Again, get a better connection to what we're trying to achieve. So let me show you how this might work. Now I've picked out one of the opening remarks in the letter to the shareholders. It says our challenge and opportunity is to accelerate our revenue and membership growth by continuing to improve our product, content, and marketing as we've done over the last 25 years and to me better monetize uh, our big audience. We're in a position of strength given our 30 billion plus in revenue, $6 billion in operating profit last year, growing free, excuse me, growing free cash flow and a strong balance sheet. So how do we break this all apart? Well, this first section, our challenge and opportunity is to accelerate our revenue and membership growth. That's all about growth. It's all about people. It's all about profit. So revenue is a profit metric. Membership, people, and how well we resonate with, the, with the, uh, our consumers and customers out there. And of course, accelerate growth. That's all about growth. Going on, if you're looking at the next part, how are we going to accelerate our revenue and membership growth? Well, we're going to do it by improving our product, improving our content, and improving our marketing. Three things that are going to come back over and over and over that are really super important to what Netflix is trying to do. 
How, what are we, what is that going to do? It's going to help us better monetize our big audience. So as you're listening to those messages, maybe you're hearing things about product content, maybe and marketing, maybe those are assets that the company has. Well, we're going to improve that. So that's growth. And to do what? Well, we've got this big audience, our, our people. How do we monetize that? How do we earn profit? How do we earn revenue off of, uh, off of our big audience? We are, after all, not a charity. We are a publicly traded company. We do have financial and fiduciary responsibilities. So we've got to be able to monetize it. All right, moving on. We're in a position. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, we're in a position of strength. What is our strength? Well, we've got 30 billion plus in revenue. We've got a large membership. We got $6 billion in operating profit last year. So we're highly profitable and we're growing our free, free cash flow, which means we can self fund what we're trying to do. And we have a strong balance sheet, which means if we do need to go access capital or if there is a recession, we've got some reserves to fall back on. So this is all about profit, revenue, operating profit. This is about growing growth in free cash flow. So growth in cash and a strong balance sheet. That's assets. So now that we've been through these, this opening message again, and we're using the five business drivers to understand a little bit more. Knowing what you know about Netflix and the streaming industry. If you were Reed Hastings, if you were Ted Sarandos, if you were the CEO of Netflix, where would you focus? Opening comments, challenge an opportunity to accelerate revenue and membership growth. How? By continuing to improve product, content, and marketing as we've done over the last 25 years and to better monetize uh, our audience. And we're in position of strength given our 30 billion plus in revenue, $6 billion in operating profit last year, growing free cash flow, and have a strong balance sheet. So, where would you focus your message, your content, your efforts? So about 50% of us are saying growth, 60, there it's going up a little bit. You got eight seconds, so get your uh, submit, make sure you submit your answer. Okay, now we're saying about 60% of us are saying growth. 60% are saying growth. Uh, about uh, 20% are saying people and about 50 or 18% are saying people and fi uh, about 15, 16% are saying profit. Interesting. Uh, I know there's some technical difficulties here. If you do have chat, would love to hear why, why you think that way. And let me put a couple of nuggets into your head as you think about what your, what your answer was. So again, we've disrupted this market. And by the way, this market is a growing market. We think that this market may be up to $360 billion within a short number of years. We have a lot of streaming services and we're thinking about expanding, well, not thinking about, we've, we see this as expansion across the globe. So no longer are we regional streaming, but now we've got global streaming. streaming. So growth, thanks, Jay. Growth because I've seen in the news that Netflix is losing subscribers recently. So I love that, Jay. Hey, you're looking at past performance. And we address, or we, I keep, you know, I'm saying the royal we. They address that slowing down in growth and the loss in subscribers. A couple other comments coming in. Mike, uh, define membership growth as people. Thus, growth equals membership. Awesome. Love it. Ken, using cash to grow into new markets. Awesome. Suranga, membership growth is critical for them to grow revenue, hence people. I love it. I love these perspectives. Now let's go look at what they really were talking about. And it's really interesting to see the results. Now, part of this part of this tool, you read the result, you read the, the remarks, and every time they talk about cash, profit, assets, growth, or people, you put a tick mark next to each one of those drivers. So here's what I found in the prepared remarks, our highest, uh, the biggest focus was placed on assets. Biggest focus was placed on assets. Then you see a lot about growth, a lot about profit and a lot about people, the very little bit, a little bit about cash. The analyst questions, pretty similar. A lot of questions about assets, a lot of questions about growth and people followed by profit and cash as well. 
So you can see kind of how I read things. And I see a lot of what you're seeing. So I feel good about uh, about what we're going to talk about here over the last uh, 20, uh, excuse me, 40 minutes or so. So the question is, if that's the focus, why? So let's go dig into this a little bit. Let's go look at another message. First and foremost, this is again, shareholder letters. So those, pre those prepared remarks. We need to continue to improve all aspects of Netflix and the bolded content there that the bolded is, is what I added here. So improve all aspects of, of Netflix, who we are as a business, and you can go see down below. It's why we strive for an ever better content marketing and product experience. Now, for me, I saw all I saw all of those things, those three things, content marketing and better experience as assets that the company has. Now, Robert Kiyosaki said, assets put money in your pocket. So I'm looking for anything that, that Netflix can use over a period of time that will drive money, that will earn them money, put money in their pocket. So content, marketing, and that product experience is what drives membership growth, brings people in, and will ultimately drive revenue and profit and cash flow growth. Um, also, as a pre pre pure play streaming business, we're unencumbered by legacy revenue streams. We're nimble. We're agile. This focus on choice and control for members, there's a bit about people, influences all aspects of our strategy, creating what we believe to be a significant long-term business advantage. So content, marketing, product experience. We're saying that's our long-term business advantage coupled with our own DNA being innovative and disruptive and uh, the fact that we're not tied down to anything else. Okay. Uh, um, all right. So Mark, again, what would you focus on because they're losing at, uh, losing everywhere, but assets keep the stock price high. They're focusing on the competitive advantage. That's exactly what they're saying right here. So on spot on, you're thinking like CEOs. So now how do analysts think? What are they uh, particularly focused on. Let me give you a couple of ideas. Again, Doug Anmuth, he's the head of U.S. Internet uh, Equity Research, so he'll follow Netflix. He'll follow also other like Amazon and Google and all the and Meta, all those internet companies. Here's what he's asking in his uh, in his interview with Netflix executives. So there are a couple of things to think about, and I've summarized some of them. So like, let's shift gears. Let's talk about advertising. How is your advertising? Because now Netflix is moving into advertising. They're even going to have an ad supported tier. So how is that going to be a better experience than just linear TV and what we as consumers have suffered through? I mean, experienced over time. So how are you investing? What technology? What experience? How is that going to be more personalized, more Netflixed than what we've seen in the past? Another one, uh, you already have tiers. So he's talking about the different tiers that we, we are on, the number of screens, the HD versus uh, uh, less uh, lower resolution. How are you, how, uh, excuse me, you already have tiers across range prices. Do you anticipate members switching plans or trading down into this ad supported? In other words, analysts are worried and the industry's worried that our shareholders, investors are worried that Netflix is going to cannibalize itself. So we're looking at the market, we're looking at a slowdown, we're looking at recession. So is that going to impact kind of the consumer, the price sensitive consumer? Are you, gonna, are you going to cannibalize your revenue all, uh, again or a little bit? And then just curious what you've learned about monetized account sharing. So that's something that they've rolled out in Latin America. The thing, the problem with account sharing, they're thinking revenue and it's in, uh, Losing revenue, so kind of shareholders sort of aspect there. Uh, they're doing a couple of tests in Latin American countries, rolling out monetizing the account sharing. So paying a little bit more to share across a user base that's not located in one household or paying a little bit more to have a separate household and sharing household accounts there. So just curious what, they, what you've learned. Now, this is important because of the way that Netflix has grown up or evolved. They're nimble, the agile. One of the things that they say they do is they test things out. They listen and then learn from what they've seen so they can make shifts and be better. You may have seen this before. Remember a number of years back when they tried to split the DVD from the streaming. 
and we kind of our hair went on fire we didn't like that so they listened they learned from that they put those two companies back together again so that's what you know talking about there and then lastly uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh how content performed in 2q and how uh, in the second quarter and how you're thinking about it in the back half so we're, they're a little bit worried about revenue generation the membership experience and content Sounds pretty familiar to what uh, Netflix is talking about. So let's dive in. We see the, the emphasis that we have around assets and growth. You see kind of the concerns that the market has. And on the opposite side of the page there in your workbook, we've got these questions. So let's dig in. What drivers seem to get the most attention and why? Well, assets and growth. Now, if you look at the main strategic initiatives that Netflix has, it involves investment in the assets, investment into content, investment into marketing, and investment into the product experience. So in content, we have the originals, we have TV, we have films, so uh, animated. In fact, they just bought a studio to produce animated feature, uh, feature length animated films. Uh, they've got non-English, so expanding beyond the U.S. and also within the U.S. beyond uh, beyond English language and then gaming. In fact, they just bought a gaming studio as well. So what they're trying to do with that content is give us a better choice, more uh, more accessibility to things that we that we want. And they're working on engagement. They talk about the Netflix effect. So how what people watch on Netflix impacts real life. In fact, they gave an example of one of their non-scripted shows, how there was an artist that was on one of those uh, contests that is now filling huge venues because they were on Netflix. When they're talking about marketing, yeah, they're also talking about, okay, how do we improve this? We've got this ad supported tier. We're partnering with Microsoft. Now's the big deal right now. What's going on there? And how do we improve the advertising and marketing experience to drive members and member growth to help people understand the value that they're getting to be able to grow revenue? So they see marketing as a platform now. And then the product experience. So making it easier and more giving us more choices. So those of us who might be a little bit more price sensitive, where we can't pay for the, you know, the five screens, full HD, UHD, all those 4K, those types of experiences. Well, now, especially if you think about recessions and people becoming a little bit more price sensitive, we have this ad supported tier. So we're paying less. Yeah, we have to look at ads, but we get all the choices that we have. We have a similar experience to what we had with Netflix. We got all the access to the original stuff, the, the licensed stuff that they have and the experience that we've come, we've come to know and love. And they're also looking at monetizing the shared account. So um, whether you like that or not, it's something that they see as part of the product experience and they're trying to enhance that product experience. They're also aware of things like how it impacts revenue and their margins and their costs and things of that nature. So assets, trying to put money in their pockets while being able to serve the membership and the consumers that we're looking at. Growth. Now, growth has been slowing. Uh, they say they've got a strong foundation, but how do we return to growth? When Mark brought up and a couple others brought up that, hey, growth has been slowing down. We've been losing memberships. So how do we return back to growth? It comes back to those three things. Content, marketing, and the product experience. Content, marketing, and the product experience. Okay, so what drivers get seem to get the most attention and why assets and growth, it comes down to three big levers that they had content marketing and product experience and what that does for us, the price, the freedom, flexibility and the variety of experiences that we have to drive membership. Okay, so what are a couple of the main points they're trying to make when they're talking about content marketing and the product experience? Well, I broke it down like near term focus. We want to make sure that we're evolving and improving monetization. So monetization, not just of those ad supported tiers and the marketing that they're trying to do there, but across the membership experience. So under advertising, these are the near term initiatives. Now we see the long term focus content marketing and product focus product experience. Now we're looking near term. What are the initiatives working we're working on right now? Advertising and now we start to think about some of the metrics. How are we measuring advertising and the success around our advertising? Well, we're looking at the price changes that we've made and that with the addition of that new ad supported tier, we're looking at ARM, which is the uh, average revenue per member. Uh, 
And what's that doing per member per month? Is that going up? Is that going down? Well, in this case, our, the arm has gone up compounded 5% annually. So that means ad supported tier may be actually a little bit more attractive to customers that are a little bit more price sensitive. We're looking at advertising that platform, that marketing platform. Now we with that partnership. What does that partnership do with us? How does that improve the better than linear TV ad experience? Uh, and then make sure that it's seamless for the member. So this experience that we've had, the personalization, make sure that all of that is there and not obtrusive when we're, uh, when we're looking at that experience. Another near-term focus is paid sharing, paid sharing. So we've launched two different models. We talked about this a little bit. We're going to listen, learn, and adjust as we go. So that's going to continue to evolve. We're going to take those lessons and continue to roll that out more broadly. And the other thing was just simplicity. You think about how big we are, $30 plus billion in revenue, $6 billion plus in uh, operating income, 221 million, uh, million subscribers across the globe. It can get very, very complex. So let's make sure that this business model is as simple as possible within the context of our growth objectives. So if you're thinking about how complex this all seems, like content, both licensed, as well as self-produced and self-funded. If you think about marketing this new tier of ad supported and this platform that we're building out and how do we make it more uh, or better experience as well as seamless for the member, how does this, how do we get this simplified, right? So what they're saying is these things are just a natural extension of what we're all already doing and they enhance the business. So make sure it is as simple as we're going. We're not making huge pivots. It's evolving, and they it, they talked about it being an iterative and evolving experience in terms of how they're growing and what they're doing, how that's expanding what they're already doing. So, and then they come back in that foundation. We've already done so. We went from licensing to originals. We went from U.S. to launching a global service. Uh, we're, we've again built out our production capabilities. So we have our studios not just doing TV uh, length, uh, but also feature length films, um, now looking at animated as well as gaming. So a couple of main points. So why is it assets and growth? Because that's how we're building the foundation and that's the trend that we've had. What are a couple of the main points? Again, near-term advertising, paid sharing, and simplicity. Those are our near-term objectives. So what are the goals, trends, and objectives going forward? And what I saw is they gave us three time horizons. Q3, we have very, very financially uh, and metrics driven uh, goals. Revenue growth at 5% year over year. Now that we have constant currency there, that means we want to eliminate the impact of the changes in value of the dollar versus global, uh, global currencies. And that has a big impact. You can see there 12% constant currency. So you eliminate the impact of the foreign exchange, 12% top line growth. That's a healthy, it's a really healthy uh, revenue uh, goal. Operating profit, look, that's going to take some investment. So they're actually uh, they're actually uh, trending down. So negative three percent growth uh, or contract uh, contraction in operating profit, although still maintaining a healthy twenty percent operating margin. These are all revenue and growth metrics. And then net ads of a million plus. So they were losing. In fact, in Q two, they thought they were going to lose two million members. They only lost a million. They want to return to growth in Q3. How? Content, marketing, product experience. We talked about the three near-term things. In fact, near-term here, uh, this is so longer than just the next quarter. Advertising, page sharing, simplicity. That may be like a 12 to 18 months. Midterm, midterm, again, adjust the cost structure. So we know recession is coming or at least a slowdown. Let's make sure that we're getting ahead of the game. Make sure that we're uh, adjusting with the market forces out there. Uh, we also have to look at the strength of the U.S. dollar. We've got to protect margins to be able, and that's important because that that funds our production and funds all of these investments that we're trying to make, and then avoid immediate actions that would be detrimental to the business. So not just getting focused on what's going on right now, but taking that near term, right, immediate, then near term, and then mid term, making sure that the the choices and, and, and decisions we're making right now are not going to be detrimental in the, in the mid and long term. And then long term, again, content, marketing, product experience. Those are the driving factors in our strategy. So um, before I look at the, the analysts, 
Uh, based on what you have heard and what you know about the streaming and media industry, how does this resonate with you as a consumer? Knowing that Netflix is focused on content marketing and product experience, knowing that they've got this really immediate near-term, long, uh, mid-term, and long-term view, how does this resonate with the consumer? How does this resonate with partners or shareholders? Would love to get your uh, your perspective in the chat box as you look at that and what you've heard in terms of the messaging out there. What do you think about Netflix's strategy? So I'll look for some comments there. And as you fill out those comments, let me give you again, I like it, but how? How are you going to do it? Const uh, content is key. Right in this business, in the media business, content is king. So whether it is licensed or whether it is uh, self-produced, content is key. So they yeah keep coming back to award-winning content. There it'll be really interesting as you hear Paramount Plus, Disney Plus, HBO Max, all of these other streaming services. How there might be a partnership, uh, but how they're going to live maybe even symbiotically to be able to continue to grow. So content is key. I like it, but how are they going to do it? Um, does that change? That Does that perspective change when you think both as a shareholder and then as a consumer? Interesting thing to look at. Now, here again, what are key, key concerns that are raised by the analyst community? Uh, Harold bundles with other streamers, so that might be, again, getting into some of that partnership. Doesn't it get into the how? Is there no plan here? Now, that's interesting, Ken. Yeah, this is, uh, this is some of that stuff they talk about is stays at the high level and some of that uh that plan really isn't um going to be given publicly in fact uh there were a couple of questions that that doug was asking that uh that executives were like hey we're not going to discuss that in, in this forum here so some of it we get kind of a perspective for what's going on so ken your question uh, doesn't it get into the how what's the plan here that might be really really important if you, especially if you're a Netflix employee or an industry insider, hey, what's going on with Netflix? What do I see within my own organization? And kind of making some judgments about what they're going to do to, do to get there. Now, if you look at the immediate and near term, they get into some specifics, but not a whole lot. Yeah, exactly right. Some questions or concerns from the analyst community, subscribers. They're worried about subscribers. They're acknowledged, like we've now acknowledged in the chat box that membership Again, membership is going to drive revenue growth. So uh, what's the impact of pricing on churn and net ads? Are you going to return to growth? What's that ad tier or excuse me, ad supported tier going to do? Is it going to uh, cannibalize what you've got to look like? What, what the, cannibalize your revenue, what you're already earning in your own membership right now? And then uh, what does subscriber growth look like? So under the product experience, they talked about this skin, this new ad supported tier. How are you going to do it? So what's uh, the technology there? Uh, you're partnering with Microsoft. What does that mean in terms of exclusivity? What's that ad experience look like? Why did you choose Microsoft was a question there. Then also, again, what's the impact to average revenue per member per month? How does that impact margins? You have to make some investments to, to get there. So what's the incremental cost and how does this evolve over time? So Teresa, how does in, in inflation impact consumers behavior as well? Yeah, this is something that's been kind of top of mind for them. In fact, as you look at Netflix, one of the things they acknowledged is if you look at the, the entertainment and media industry, entertainment has generally been resilient in recessions and downturns. Why? Well, because people want to escape a little bit. Times are tough. So give me an avenue to kind of get away from my, the, the stresses of what's going on and, and what I'm hearing about news and, and, and uh, the economy. Uh, so typically streaming especially has been sticky and has been resilient. Do I need five streaming services? Great question. So that's where that content uh, marketing and product experience comes in, it's how they differentiate themselves, which was a, a, a word that they said a number of times. So it shows to me that they're acknowledging that the differentiation, being able to provide that value beyond what they're already seeing is important. Uh, again, you see a couple other things like monetization. What are they doing there in terms of technology and timing, the content? Uh, how do you balance quality and scale? You spent $17, $18 billion last year, kind of accelerated for, for COVID. What are you going to do continuing on? 
if you're going to ratchet it back a little bit, um, how do you maintain the quality of the content that you've produced? Um, how do you maintain the scale? Like you got great, uh, you've got global members now. How do you get that global membership? So other languages, other locations, the content, the culture, the all of those uh, things that uh, are go beyond just the U.S. here. Uh, leverage engagement of new content to drive viewing of other content. How do you go, how are you going to do that? And then investment spend again. How much are you spending to do that? Uh, then lastly, performance operating margin. How do you protect margins? How do you continue to grow free cash flow? What does that look like? You said there's substantial free cash flow growth. Okay, what do you think, what does that look like? What are the puts and takes to be able to get there? So those were the co the concerns, right? It's almost as if they, Doug was acknowledging the strategy, the, the immediate, uh, near, medium, and long-term ideas and what's driving long-term growth. But okay, how are you really going to do that? We get a little bit of color on that, not a whole lot. So we've got to think about that. Thanks, Mike. How did they keep customers happy with the new binge-watching model? Now the norm. In fact, that's one of the things they did look at is as they're producing, and this is the flexibility of being self-produced. And having their Netflix originals and just something like uh, uh, Stranger Things season four is they will they will instead of waiting to release a, an episode every week, they're just going to release a whole chunk of episodes. I think uh, Stranger Things uh, season four they released half of the half of of the season uh, because of you know shutdowns and COVID and things of that nature. So they're going to continue to do that. And again, one of the things that they've done, I think, in terms of disrupting the uh, uh, the business model, right, the the industry there. So again, I love it. You can start to read between the lines. You start to see the pressures there. You start to see them acknowledging what's going on with the economy, what's going on with consumers, what the experience we've come to expect is, and how they're going to enhance that. How do we know they're going to be successful? How are they going to measure success? Now, if you flip the page in your guide, you'll see this navigating the financials tool. Now, I'm going to suggest that you do it a number of, uh, of different comparisons here. But let me explain to you how it works. We've talked about the five business drivers, things that we need to measure. Now, this one is pretty generic, but we can still use it to understand what's going on. Right here, we've got cash. And then you go down, you've got ass profit, assets, growth, and people established. Now, if I were going to um, if I were going to customize this for Netflix, I would look at putting membership numbers in there. What are net ads? What's the churn like? How many members do you have right now? That would be a key success metric if I were to look at just Netflix. To be able to do this, we're looking for these metrics right there. How much cash do we have on hand? This is the line item that we want to look for, cash and cash equivalents. This next statement column tells us which financial statement to look at. And then right here, we're going to give our answers. Now, you'll see down below, if there's an equation, you'll see this equation right there, but there's a place to put our numbers, and we're going to look at a comparison. So let's go look at a couple of, do a couple of these, a uh, few of these things together. We want to know how much cash Netflix had at the end of Q2. So if we were to go over and look at the balance sheet, balance sheet right here, we're going to look for cash and cash equivalents. You can see... Over at end of Q2, June 30th, 2022, we've got $5.8 billion. Again, they're reporting in thousands. So that's $5.8 billion. And we're going to write that right there at the top. Next one is cash from operations. So what's our cash flow? All the stuff that we did, what cash did that generate? So we're looking for cash from operations on the statement of cash flows. So if we flip over to the statement of cash flows, this first section is the cash from operating activities, and we're looking for net cash provided by operating activities. Come over here six months ended June 30th, uh, 2022, or if you're just looking at the three months ended there, uh, I've got $103 million just in that quarter. Okay, total revenue. Looking at the income statement, I'm looking for revenues. Again, six months ended 15.8, or if you're just looking at the quarter, $7.97 billion. We're just looking at the quarter in this case. So $7.9 billion. Uh, if we were to look at net income, net income, net income is the bottom line. So I'm going to go to the income statement and look for net income. I usually look for kind of this bolded or double underlined number. 
Net income for the month, $1.4 billion. Write that up there. And we can keep going on and on. For example, net income margin, we're going to take net income divided by revenue here at the top. There's the answer. Our revenue, uh, excuse me, our net income margin, net profit margin, 18.1%. Start matching this reperformance with what we're saying we're going to do in Q3. How are we going to get there? How does that compare to last year? Here are the answers we're looking at. Do we see the right trend? Well, we've got less cash, but that's okay. One of the things we acknowledge, this is about two months of expenses. We're driving cash flows where, as the year before, we're burning cash in our operations. We've seen some good progress with revenue, higher revenue. We see revenue growth. We see net income growth. We see a healthy net profit margin. Down at the bottom, we see earnings per share growth. In between assets, financial strength of 41%. Uh, equity ratio is up over Q2 of 2021, puts us in a strong position, and the utilization 3.1% return on assets is decent. We look to continue to improve that. So we see this comparison quarter uh, over, uh, excuse me, quarterly comparison year over year. We could also look at, hey, what's the first half look like this year versus last year? And take a look at that. Uh, we can also look at things like, hey, uh, what does, what do we, how do we compare to Warner Brothers and some of our competitors? Or we might start looking beyond that and thinking about what's coming down the pike. Now, a Apple, how is Apple going to jump into the fray? And what resources do they have? We've made a big deal that we're self-funded. So can Apple self-fund? A streaming platform and build that out rather than uh, and build out their own Apple originals. What's the chances that they can do it and they can jump in in a bigger way? And how do we compare to Apple? I know they're slightly different businesses, but uh, what can we do there? So again, you're looking at the diff the performance over time. What are we doing? How does that compare? And uh, thinking about ahead, what's going on? And do we set ourselves up? to achieve our strategy, to invest in product or invest in marketing and content and product, uh, product experience. So let me see a couple of questions here in the chat box or comments in the chat box. Ken, not sure if I would invest uh, in Netflix versus Apple. Um, yeah, good questions. Like, how do you want to invest? Where do you want to invest? Do you want to invest in a streaming partner or do you want to invest in a more diversified uh, and very, very strong brand? Your good question, Ken. What are the strengths and weaknesses of ETH each? Harold, seems like Apple and Amazon would be able to fund their streaming service from revenues they have with from other products. Yeah, absolutely. They've got a, at least Apple has a huge coffer of funds that they can go and invest, you know, 17, 18 million billion dollars in content and be okay. Because not only do they have $28 billion in cash, they're generating $75 billion in the first half of the year. So yeah. Uh, gotta ask, how are you going to differentiate yourself? Not just from current streaming flat platforms, but some of these emerging ones. And some of them that have global reach as well. Yeah. So great, uh, great comment there, Harold. So we've done this analysis and what we're looking for again is what's the strategy? What are they trying to achieve? We've identified some of their focuses, right? We've identified that they're focused on assets and growth. We've looked at this, you know, immediate towards long-term focus of initiatives and strategy that they've had. We are looking at a pretty healthy financial performance and how they're looking to improve and what that trend is going to be like over time. It seems like at least at a, at a, with this analysis that we've done, that Netflix's trends show that they are going to achieve their strategies, or that at least they're in a position, like they have said. They've built a foundation and then are in a strong position to be able to achieve what they say they're going to achieve. It's just a matter of competitors get a say, right? They also get a say in what's going on. So it'll be interesting to see how they go beyond just a, a focus on Netflix and what they're doing, but also to see how they react to the evolution of the, of the marketplace. Okay, so now that we've done this analysis, we gotta think, how do we apply this? So whether we are internal to Netflix, whether we're an industry insider, or whether we're just looking for a different perspective to apply to our own industry and where we are, whether it's applied to technology or whether we're applying it to uh, healthcare or whatever, how do we apply this? So I'd ask you to think about that. How do you apply this to what we're already doing? 
to what we see in the marketplace. How did the market react to the quarter results? Well, uh, you know, it's kind of a tough one to see. Their, their, their stock price has been pretty healthy. Uh, I think I checked a couple of days ago. It was down to, uh, to $226 a share uh, when I checked. But the whole market has been tanking for a number of years, a number of weeks now. So uh, hard to say they've been pretty healthy, but uh, whole market's been down. When you consider that a studio like Disney has produced multiple billion dollar singular movies, it's sort of insane that Netflix has produced so much content and has only made a billion dollars through half of the year. Yeah, so sometimes for them, again, the spend uh, can be a little bit chunky. So that would impact the, the amount of uh, cash flow coming in is the timing of their spend. Um, and when they're doing that, some of that's going to be uh, capital expenditure. So, again, deployment of other capital outside of operations. But, yeah, um, they certainly have some giants that they're competing with. So far, they've been successful. But that's why I mean, hey, it's going to be interesting to see what they do with the uh, with their competitors and how the economy and how the, the industry evolves. So, how do we apply this? So, page six in your guide, you're looking at the application. So we're going to take things like, hey, what insights did we gain? And based on what we learned, how do we, what actions can we take? So I think the key is to get viewers to grow, uh, to, to get viewers and grow membership. So how important is the plan to get new members? Yeah, certainly a key. And I think that'll be uh, certainly an evolution that we see there. So insights, here are a couple of insights that I got, right? Netflix has built uh, the business on principles. Those are enduring principles. Uh, they were there before things like content, content being king. Uh, marketing, so how do you get a bigger share of voice and then the product experience or a consumer experience if you're looking outside of, of, uh, of Netflix? So how does that compare to what we're doing? Uh, content is king. Uh, we've achieved scale. We've self-funded. We're continuing to evolve. And then you get content, marketing, product experience right there. The importance of those key fundamental drivers in the marketplace, uh, at least within the media and industry. But you might also think, how does that apply outside of that? So a couple of things to think. I might consider investing in Netflix, especially as the entire market is down, be able to uh, ride out hopefully some of those storms. But they seem to be in a good position. It'll be, again, interesting, like many of you brought up, how they're going to compete with Disney Plus and other streaming. Uh, continue following Netflix's results on a quarterly basis. See how that trends, especially if I'm going to invest in Netflix. I want to make sure that that performance uh, is maintained and improves. Then watch how, the, again, the industry evolves. So look at not just Netflix, not just Paramount Plus and HBO Max, but also Apple, Amazon, Google. What are they doing there? Big players there. And lastly, uh, things to do outside of that. Look, uh, you want to get a different perspective. So if you have analyzed your company, think about another company that you can analyze. Maybe uh, you want to analyze a customer or a partner. If you analyze a competitor, again, uh, you might want to look at that. So other things to do. Uh, also, get to your team, right? So let me just, again, a couple of things to think about as we wrap up today. Re prepare, analyze, and apply. Those are three things that we've got to do. You've got to also not just look at uh, the materials that we have right now, but also compare that to your to past calls and what you know about the industry and then meet with your team. You may want to analyze someone else. So if you uh, want to analyze someone else again in the chat box, who are you going to analyze? Maybe that's something you want to take on. Who are you going to analyze in your next uh, for the next earnings call that you do? We're going to do Disney on October 26th. So if you're interested in coming back for Disney and seeing the whole picture of Disney, not just the streaming, uh, come back on October 26th there. So who are you going to analyze? A lot of you saying, hey, I'm going to look at company I work for, about 60% of us now. 10% uh, of, 10 of us, company I sell to. You see the power of these earnings calls that help us understand what the company is doing. So being able to connect with our customers or our partners or our own strategy is super important and measuring the performance and then kind of reading between the lines. What are they going to do? How are they going to evolve? Will help us kind of build value for that customer partner that we have or even the company that we have. Uh, about half, a third of us are going to invest in a company that, or excuse me, third of us are going to analyze a company you want to invest in, 10% of the company you're interested in, Company 10% of the company you sell to, 40% the company that you work for. Awesome. Love it. Now, a little bit about us. We've worked with 30 of the Fortune 50 companies out there and a couple of things that we've do, done. Hey, good morning. Where can I locate this guide uh, from today's presentation? All those, uh, 
uh, that will be emailed to you and this video recording of this will be will be available posted on our on our website as well as if you've been through um, our one of our courses acumeninaction.com uh, do you think that account sharing will result in Netflix losing influence over culture um, I don't I think it, I, I uh, see a little bit of uh, in personal opinion I see a little bit of cannibalization but I also uh, see that they're going to add right because uh, 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 lead, uh, as things get more cost conscious or as consumers get more cost conscious I think it's an opportunity for them Here's what acumen learning and, and here's what business acumen can do for you. Some of the things that we've helped our clients do uh, improve performance, uh, improve collaboration, communications, employee engagement, things of that nature. And again, um, if you want, uh, we've got uh, a number of different ways that you can engage with us, whether it's online learning, whether it is with your company and, and uh, live training. Uh, there's a way to get uh, have some cost savings there. We'll email you the workbook and hope to see you next time, October 26th. We'd love to hear from you. We'll, we'll uh, send out a, um, a survey. We'd love to get your comments, love to get your feedback. How can we improve? How can we help you build value within your company? How can we help you build your credibility, influence, career, and performance at your company? Hey, thanks very much again for being here. I'll uh, we'll stick around if you've got further questions. Love to answer those in the chat box as well. But thanks again for being here and appreciate your time. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Thank you, Oscar. It's been a pleasure. Any other comments? Again, hey, Karen, thanks very much. Ken, awesome. Love that you enjoyed it. Tony, uh, it's been my pleasure. Again, we'll uh, email you the, the workbook and you'll have access to the recording on our website. Awesome, Harold. Love that you enjoyed it. My pleasure, Suranga. Appreciate you being here. Good to see you again. My pleasure, Martin. Laura, awesome. Love to see that you'll be back. Be happy to have you. Cool. Well, if there aren't any other questions, again, a uh, number of ways to interact with us. Um, go to acumenlearning.com, contact us there. If, or uh, if you've been in a session before, feel free to uh, contact us through your contacts or the email that uh, one of our, our senior consultants may have given you. Appreciate it. Uh, we're going to sign off. Thanks for being here. Look forward to having you again.